We are live. Huzzah! Supposedly. <laughs> Supposedly. Alive. Let us... Alive? We are alive, but we are live. Uh, is Jello in frame? Uh, he is not in frame. Oh, okay. Because I wasn't sure about uh, yeah. the balloons and stuff. I was going to let you... Well, we'll just move him on over. People want to see their chromatic chicken for the chromatic chicken scouts. Uh, yeah, you can't... Warm. You can't come. You can't... You can't bite me. So he's in frame just barely. Right now. Okay. You can't bite me or the balloons. No, no. You want to get on my arm so badly because you want to eat my buttons. He loves buttons. Um, um, just a quick test. Can you let us know if you can hear us? So, um, a rare Tuesday stream instead of uh, instead of Thursday because we have a little Kickstarter going, which has. Uh, been quite the uh, quite the event. Um, you guys are crazy. Uh, we thought that you know we might. Um, our our goal was to sell five thousand of these. Um, we ordered ten thousand, so we'd have some for the holiday season. You have bought all of those and then some. So on the first day. So we're uh, we're going to have to have Brandon sign a whole lot more signatures. Um, Isaac's over there, which is what I keep looking at. Huh. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I, I would like to mention at this this point that we are still planning on our, our partner bookstores to have some in time for the holiday season. Yes. So that is something, if you missed out on the book and want it this year, watch for posts from us about how to get it from uh, th those booksellers. But that we're a few months away from that. Yep. Yeah, best. you're going to try so hard to get on me. Um, okay. Yeah, when we have Jello on, we should maybe move the camera back. Wide enough. Uh, oh, you zoomed yeah. out so I so can move him away. Because oh. if he's close enough to me that he thinks yeah. he might be able to get my uh, get my arm and get onto me, yeah. he will try because he is a very loving chicken, and he we will give him scratches in a minute. But right now, I actually need to talk to the audience, Jello. Okay, we're good. Um, so yeah, uh, huzzah! We are inching toward four million dollars. Um, which is crazy. In fact, we have a little thing to set off, uh, assuming we hit it in the middle of the stream, which we are very close to. Um, so, um, so yeah, um, thank you guys so much. Uh, we are, as I understand, the largest uh, publishing Kickstarter ever. Is that correct? Yes, we are number, number one, and we hit that in the first 10 minutes. So we became the number one publishing Kickstarter in 10 minutes. That, that, that is what I have been told. Wow. All right. Uh, so Kickstarter is very happy with us. I think so. Mm. I, I hope so. They've been great to work with. They have been. They, get, they signed us someone really early on uh, to, to help us put this thing together. Uh, the team, like, I have barely done anything other than supervise and be like, do this, do this, make it happen. <laughs> I get to be Captain Picard. Make it so. Um, and uh, really, it's been Isaac and Kara and uh, Adam who have been putting all this together. Uh, particularly like Adam's uh, work on the, uh, the video at the start. Yeah, well nice done, job. Adam. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Michael and Kate also. Yes, thank you. They, uh, they are awesome. Um, and they um, only asked us to give a donation to charity, as I understand, rather than... Yeah, yeah they, they asked us to donate to uh, the Prison Book Program. Oh, yeah. It's a great cause, so if anybody's looking for something uh, to donate to, it's something I would look at. Yeah, they, uh, that's all they asked when we said, hey, will you record this thing for us? So, uh, great people. We were hoping to have Michael be at one of my tour stops uh, for the Book 4 release, but... We don't know if there will be a tour for book four. Uh, looking less and less likely. The book will still come out. Um, d don't fear that. But we really have no updates on the release party um, other than, you know, we were prepared to host 5,000 of you or more. Um, but um, it's not looking like it will be a good time to have 5,000 people congregate. We'll see how it is. That is where we are. Uh, today, um, I am signing Warbreaker leather-bound signature pages. If you aren't familiar with these, these are um, a signature is a chunk of pages. They get folded up, sliced, and stitched into a book. And uh, rather than 
get the books from the printer, then sign them and then repackage them. We have started just signing them like this and then having them be bound together. Um, that way we don't have to have as many hands touching them and as many, uh, we don't have to break away all the wonderful packaging they put on. So uh, anyway. Speaking of signatures, if we want to at some point, I can show uh, those signature pages for the oh, Way yeah. of Kings. Yeah, we can. In fact, we, we totally should because yeah. people will be very interested to see some of the artwork and things. Yeah. Um, so uh, I don't know how we're going to do that on camera. Um, I think if we show it like this and Adam can kind of tell me if it's in frame. Yeah. Well, uh, since you mentioned that, why, why don't we, we start do that? with that? Because I, uh, people have have bought us out, though there, we are going <laughs> to print more, so you can still do the Kickstarter. Um, but. Because of that, uh, you should at least see some of this, the cool stuff you're getting yeah. with, uh, with the artwork for this book. So I, I, can, I can walk us quickly kind of mm -hmm. through the process for making one of these books since yeah. uh, you're going to get one. And I, I have saved the different steps for this very purpose that I can share it. So um, after we design the book, we lay it out in InDesign. Peter goes through it with a, a fine tooth comb and, and finds uh, any... And, and does fixes and things that we've found since the time that it was uh, printed in hardcover and paperback. Um, okay, we're getting close to four million, so you might stop me in the middle of this and we'll celebrate. Yes. Um, but after we send it to the printer, they print us up a proof, and it's these, these big things like this that inside we can go through and make sure the pages are in the right order, the artwork isn't printed exactly how it's going to show up in the final. Um, but, you know, they give us these nice printouts of what, what the end papers might look like. Um, and they try to give us as close of an idea as possible. And, and, and occasionally we'll find errors and we fix them. But that's v volume one and volume two in the proofs. And I'll show you um, what they wind up looking like after in just a moment. But then we design which I really like. This is fun. I get to pick out colors, and I get to pick out colors of foil. We'll go through it quickly. I could spend a lot of time on this. But hey, you know, I get to pick like cool foil colors, and I get to pick what is our leather going to look like. There's a Pepto-Bismol pink I'm thinking to, of using for alloy of law. Um, with maybe... I twist it, you said? Yeah, yeah follow okay. the arrows. Yeah, aim it towards us. Yeah. Aim it toward you? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's going to be out of frame. Okay. <laughs> well, is the bird going to like it? Jello, I'm going to move you back for a second. Yeah, come on. <laughs> and I'm you going to. Okay, I'm going to aim at you, and I just twist it. Follow the arrows. Whoa! Woo! Wow. I don't know how much of that went in the frame, but. That's a. That's a big old mess for you guys to play. Yeah, <laughs> so somebody's yeah, war breaker is going to have confetti in it. Yeah, if you uh, if you get a war breaker leather bound uh, that comes with pieces of confetti, uh, you will know why. So that was uh, that was pretty extreme. Wow. Are you okay, Bird? Woo! Woo! Okay? Woo! Felt like you got a shower. Yeah. You all right? It's a bit of a. It's okay. Yeah. You like loud noises, huh? <laughs> you just want to sit on my shoulders and try to eat my glasses. That's what you want to do the whole time that you are here. Um, all right. Well, four million. Um, woo! That is, uh, that is, we did not expect to hit that on the first day. We didn't expect to hit that really at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, all righty. Yeah. We don't get to keep all of that. We'll just warn you of that because Kickstarter does include all the shipping mm -hmm. money. Um, in that and things like that, but it is still pretty incredible. Yeah, that is pretty incredible. Awesome. Yeah. We are such an enthusiastic bunch, Isaac. You and me. <laughs> <laughs> all, all the team is, but Isaac and I are like, this is our excited face. Yeah. yeah. Inside, we're like, happy, happy dance. Mm -hmm. You know. Are you so concerned about this, Jello? <laughs> Part of this is is about you, um, because of the chromatic chickens. <laughs> All right, why don't you continue right. on? I yeah, think. Well, well, I'll go through this. I'm trying to go through it as quickly as possible because I'm sure there's some people just okay. who aren't as interested, but, uh, you know, there's all sorts of different colors of the, these leathers. Um, and th these are bonded leathers. I have a different supplier that we go through for the genuine leather, which 
we hit with the stretch goal. Um, this is an actual sample that I don't know how well it's showing up on there. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's probably darker than... Yeah. Um, it, but, it's lighter than it looks. But we do have a, uh, yeah, it's kind of a stormy blue. It's a mm -hmm. little bit different from the Elantra leather band if you have that. It's a, a, a little finer grain. And then it's actually genuine leather. We'll do an unboxing here. Um, in about a week, I should be getting a sample with oh, yeah? the foil on it. And we'll we'll mm -hmm. unbox that and post that to the, post the, that to the, as an update. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that that's something exciting that we'll do. Um, in this... I also got to pick out the colors for the slip case. This is kind of a uh, faux linen that will go over the top of it. I don't know what this foil is that they have on here as far as like the design, but this was the sample they sent in the foil that is coming on uh, your slip case. So we get to pick that, we make sure that it looks good together. You see the little mock-up that I did that's on the Kickstarter page. That That's all fun and um, the thing that Brandon is signing right now are uncut signature pages. And this is interesting because you can see at the top, you can't really fold it or anything, but they're these sort of perforations like an old you know, dot matrix printer or something. Um, what they will do is they put these all together in a big stack once, th these are all 16 pages each. Uh, they put it together in a big stack and then they cut it along all these lines and suddenly all of these that have perforations and stuff in them become real pages. And I'll show you some of those. So I'm not sure which book this one is. This one's Mistborn. I don't. But this is what they all look like together. You have all of these different uh, signatures put together. Which is not confusing at all that they call them signatures. Signatures, and you're signing them. Yes. Yes, and Brandon signs the first signature. <laughs> I signed my signature on the first signature of the book. I have to, when we're talking to our printing rep, I have to call Brandon autographing the signature uh, because yes. we just... Um, but you can see here, these will then be sewn in together. And I can show you what that looks like with an actual copy of the book. And this one will show off a couple of, uh, we'll, yeah. we'll spoil some new art. Yes, we've got a lot of new art in this leather bound. So there's a, they put a piece of strong paper. It's, it's almost fabric-like that they then use to um, sew all of the pages together. And these, if we go to one of the, the in-between signatures, you can find all of the, uh, the sewing. Not all books are done that way. Mm -hmm. Normally they're glued. Uh, so this makes it a little more robust. It's called Smith Sewn. Um, and then that will be bound into the binding. We'll show that at a, a later thing. But uh, we've, we've shown a few things already. Here's uh, the, the back end papers. Down a little bit. There we go. These are done by Howard Lyon. Um, he's done a great job kind of matching the style of Michael's covers of the storm and things. Howard's really great at clouds. We've got Kaladin um, on the bridge looking out toward the, that. I love that piece. So it turned out really nice. We haven't revealed that one yet? Um, we, it's, there's a smaller picture oh, okay. on the Kickstarter, mm -hmm. but I wanted to, to highlight that a bit more. Yeah. Of course, in front we have Michael Whalen's art, which is great, and he's been amazing to work with. I'm just gonna flip it open here and find something. Yeah. Um, okay. Miranda Meeks. Mm. We have not seen this before in Miranda. If you're watching, I'm sorry that I didn't tell you that we're going to do this. Um, but this is Miranda Meeks's piece of Dalinar and Navani. If you remember near the middle of the book, they meet um, at one of the parties, I think on one of the islands and Navani's sort of like, uh, wanting to talk to Dalinar and he's very sort of offish and doesn't know how to, very awkward. Um, and that's this moment. We wanted to kind of show, show that. Um, Navani's a little more calculating. Dalinar's not sure what to do. Um, which is kind of a different take on Dalinar because we're normally showing him in these awesome poses, giving up Oathbringer, things like that. And here he's a little out of his element. Um, so that's one of my favorite pieces from here. Let, let's find uh, one of Steve Argyle's. Yeah, so one, one of the things we did is that every part, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's going to be five of those? 
There are five of them. Yeah, yep. five of them. Uh, we did these um, rather than the um, ones we have in the regular book, which are just kind of the symbol. We did new artwork for those, the the part, the sections. And uh, Steve actually, we wanted, we knew that we wanted him to do something on the book, and he approached us with this idea of doing kind of these woodcut illustrations for the the end of the parts. And so Brandon and I and uh, Steve brainstormed some ideas of what those illustrations mm -hmm. might be, and uh, some of the really cool moments. And I'm going to show you right here. This is um, Dalinar fighting the Chasm Fiend. It's the end of part two, and uh, it just turned out really great. There's this, if you're familiar with the illustrator Gustav Doré, he did a lot of things like uh, old books of the Inferno. He did Dante's Inferno. He did some biblical illustrations, and you've it's probably just, seen his illustrations. Yeah, of those those kind of black and white, almost woodblock ish. I don't yeah. know if they were woodblocks, but they feel like that. Yeah, they do. They mm -hmm. might have been. They might have been copper plate engravings. Yeah, but uh, just just an amazing work. And and Steve has done a great job emulating that style. Um, his process for this is fascinating, and he's produced some really great illustrations for us. And, and throughout the Kickstarter, we'll spoil more and more art. Um, hopefully, you'll you'll be able to see by the end most of what you're getting with the with the book. So, um, I think that's a good place to to stop for now on on yeah. this. But uh, and, um, if you want me to spoil more later, I can. I yeah. can find something. Yeah, we'll find, let's do one more later. Okay. Uh, some other piece of art or. Um, have you spoiled yet the archways and stuff? How, how we're doing those? No, no, I can yeah. I can spoil that. The They're There's, in the video. We'll, oh, we'll show right. a close up yeah. of uh, of the archway, one of the archways. How about that? Yeah, sounds later. sounds good. Um, so, yeah. Um, of course, my part in this is I have to write the novella. Uh, we'll probably <laughs> uh, I will finish Stormlight Four this week is the goal. Um, at the very latest over the weekend, the last draft. Um, sending it on to production and then uh, from there I think my next job is to spend one week doing a revision on uh, Songs of the Dead is what we we put in the schedule next this is the uh, the new name of Death by Pizza um, heavy metal music influenced necromancer uh, urban fantasy um, that I'm co-authoring with Peter O'Rulian who is um, a heavy metal singer so um, I'm going to do a draft on that, and then it is writing the novella uh, for about the next month. So we'll start posting updates on that as I do that. And I think I know what the title is going to be. So we might announce that in a little while here, not tonight, but in the upcoming days. Um, you'll be very excited by the title, I suspect. So, uh, Adam, why don't we throw a few questions at me, and then, um, or at Isaac, um, and then uh, we'll do some fan mail. Um, so you kind of already answered this one, but mm -hmm. see if you want to say any more about it. it. says, did you expect the Kickstarter to go as it did? Um, I had no idea what to expect, honestly. Um, we thought maybe, like, we thought we were pretty safe. Um, having me sign 10,000 of these, um, that even if the Kickstarter didn't do 10,000, we could take those, uh, the extra 5,000 and we could have them bound later on. We were pretty sure like we would eventually get to that, um, like Mistborn and stuff. We're approaching 10,000 sales, aren't we, Kara? Somewhere around there. Um, so, so we, we, we thought that would be... Good. We basically we were planning on all of our stretch goals. We're kind of focused on the idea of us selling five thousand um, of these in the Kickstarter uh, across the whole thing, and um, we sold ten thousand in the first uh, four hours. Yeah, or so, yeah. We had hit ten thousand by the time I woke up uh, for the day. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. Um, so, uh, n no, now I have no idea what, I didn't have any idea what to expect before. I knew 5,000 was a pretty safe number. Um, now I have no idea. What, what's partially exciting about this is, um, as we said, we're not going to do Kickstarters for most of our leather bounds, but we will probably do one for Words of Radiance. We now will know um, how many we can print of Words of Radiance, which in many uh, respects lets us give more goodies because ev the more copies we order at once, the more the price comes down on things. Up to a certain up point. To a certain point. Yeah. Um, 
And so we'll have to look at that, but don't like the, the slip cases get cheaper if we order 20,000 yeah. instead of 10,000. Yeah, the slip cases do. Yeah. Uh, genuine leather hits a point and then it's just the and same. And then it's just the same because yep. you're paying for the, yeah. Because you're, you're... Uh, the genuine leather is really expensive, but mm -hmm. we really wanted to do it. And so we wanted to, we, we are glad we hit that milestone and we know that we can afford it. Um, but yeah, we, we really had no idea what to expect. Uh, the biggest publishing Kickstarters in history um, were a fraction of where we are now. And so we thought maybe if we beat that number and get to a million dollars, that we will have the record and that would be about 5,000 copies. And so now, no idea. Um, I'm going to expect that we're going to be very heavily front-loaded, more so even than most Kickstarters. I know most Kickstarters tend to be heavily front-loaded, but... Just the way that our book sales go and things, I'm going to expect that uh, the first day is the big day, but who knows? Who knows where it'll go? Um, so thank you for sharing this with your friends and uh, for letting people know about it. And really, honestly, it gives me a lot of peace of mind um, that we're not going to uh, have a ton of these sitting around that we can't sell um, or sitting at the publisher printer waiting for us to actually be able to afford to have them print um, or uh, honestly um, if uh, there's always this worry in the back of your head um, when you're in publishing that the entire publishing industry is going to collapse because everyone in the industry acts like it's going to collapse at any moment they've been doing this my editor told me you know since the mass market paperback was invented uh, back well over a hundred years ago, everyone's been assuming that publishing will collapse, but they're still assuming it. And so there's always a part of you as an author, it's like, man, what do I do? If publishing collapses, I have to go sell insurance or something. Um, the fact that, uh, that we know we can crowdfund a book if we need to is a huge, uh, it is a relief um, that if everything went south, um, we, we could. We don't want to, uh, in part because we really like bookstores. Um, if publishing went south, that would not be good for bookstores. Um, and I owe a lot, I think, of my success to particularly those little bookstores that hand sell a lot. What happens in publishing, this is just me going off on random tangents. I hope you guys enjoy that. What happens in publishing is the more popular you get, the less hand selling you need. Um, and, you know, the more places like Costco and whatnot will pick up your book and you'll be sold through non-traditional book mediums. But when you're a brand new author, the way you sell really comes down to three things. How nice is your cover and, you know, your packaging? Uh, how much word of mouth do the people who pick up the book give the book to their friends? And how much do bookstore employees read the book and recommend it? And I feel that I got a lot of help. And I feel like the digital revolution has been really good in a lot of ways. But one of the places it's hurt is new authors. It's a lot harder for new authors to launch than it used to be. Just because um, people browse differently now. And a lot of the slack in bookstores closing has been picked up by non-traditional markets like Costco and things like that, which is fine for someone like me that has name recognition and whatnot. But if you launch as a brand new author these days, it's, it's just harder than it ever has been, uh, which is incongruous because I think more people are able to make a living than they used to make, uh, which is good. But I think it's also just that much harder on that new author. And so, anyway, I love that bookstores exist, and I think they are vital for discovering new authors and helping the careers of new authors. So, hopefully, we will not ever have to worry about losing our bookstores. But if we do, for some reason, lose publishing and it collapses, we can get those books to bookstores ourselves. Uh, what else you got for me, Adam? Well, this next question... Uh, this next question is actually for Isaac. Great. Um, they want to know what the hardest and easiest things to do for you for the Kickstarter work. Uh, I, I think that the, the hardest thing was kind of 
the carving out of the shape of the Kickstarter, where we, we started with something really sort of nebulous. We weren't exactly sure. Uh, the, the process has been difficult. Learning something new, right? We're start, I'm starting to become an old dog. And learning new tricks is a little bit harder and harder the older that you get. And so kind of learning the Kickstarter. Luckily, we've had Adam and Kara and Kara's team um, working on this. But yeah, we, we went and interviewed a bunch of people who had run successful Kickstarters, trying to figure out what is the best way to do this. And, and, and so far, I mean, it, it seems to be working out okay. We're still in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And there's st we're going to be processing orders and things for months. And so we're going to learn some things still. And, and I, I, th I think overall it's just been this process. Um, yeah, my biggest worry, having followed some Kickstarters, particularly of like video game companies, is I hate hearing the stories of the Kickstarter that happens that everyone's excited to buy, and then four years later, nothing has happened. Mm -hmm. Like, that is my nightmare scenario, um, which I don't think is that worrisome because we have done this already yep. enough times with the smaller ones, but I will feel a lot more comfortable once we know everyone has gotten their rewards. And mm -hmm. everyone is happy, um, and we have done it in a timely way. That's uh, yeah, yeah, and that that that's going to be our biggest hurdle too. Not hurdle, but just you can sometimes never tell when you print a mm -hmm. book how long it's going to take. Especially we were even before the pandemic and things. A lot of the uh, paper mills were closing. Uh, some of the printers were combining the, and consolidating. Uh, it, it, it the realities of printing are sort of interesting. Um, it's a printer can make a lot more money printing a four color packaging for a toy from Mattel than it can printing a, a book. And so there's fewer and fewer uh, presses that are running books and things like that. And so we get our books on onto press when they can get on there. And uh, it was, we just we can't calculate exactly when a book might come in. But but our partners have been really good to work with on these things. Yeah, it's a huge level up for us to be able to ship the uh, leather-bound Way of Kings directly from the printer yeah. to everyone who ordered them. That'll just make it s that much faster and easier for everyone. So. It, it also ensures that you're getting a pristine book. Yeah. It, it ha doesn't have to go through Brandon's hands and a bunch of other people's hands after it's been signed. You get it shrink-wrapped directly from the bindery. That said, if they do end up with one, that's a problem. They send it uh, to us, yes. right, to yep. get a replacement. Yeah, so. yeah. If for, for example, sometimes there's uh, books that somehow get bound upside down. Yep, that Th happens. Things like that. Mm -hmm. um, less or more rare is when pages are missing or something. Yep. But just contact us. Yeah, once in a while a page gets folded, I've noticed. Yeah. Not just in books I've bought where during the printing a page gets folded and then it gets printed in this weird way where mm -hmm. you've like, there's a blank side to half of this page, a little triangle of blankness and double printing. Um, yeah. So so what what's going yeah. on there is when a, a signature slips out of place and then gets cut in a weird way or mm. it folds inside. Yeah. Uh, kind of Kind of weird all the weird printing things that we learn about, right? So team, are you guys looking forward to carting uh, what's looking to be something like 15,000 posters to the post office? Oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the post office is going to love us, aren't they? When we show up with... We, we, we are can, on really good terms with our local yeah. post yes. office. Can, so, can, yeah. we, uh, can we get a picture maybe for the update tomorrow of the Great Wall of Posters? Yes, the Great Wall of Posters. That's a, or Adam can post it right now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, um, so the poster is that thing that we're going to have to get feedback from all of you guys on um, because we love the poster. It looks gorgeous. But the fact that we decided to not fold it, which was the right move, means that the shipping is more expensive for everyone and the handling, the, you know, the t amount of time um, we are uh, having to have. Uh, Poor Jacob over there sit and roll uh, posters. <laughs> um, oh, yeah? Mostly. It's mostly, mostly. Every yeah. single day for five hours. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, we are, uh, we are paying a lot of money in uh, post poster rolling um, that makes us wonder if posters are the best thing that we could be giving. Uh, that brings, that mentions uh, kind of, we do want to add, we can't add a ton more stretch goals because we cut the margins on this thing pretty tight already. 
Um, but we may want to add, we added the chromatic chicken scout stuff that we promised, mm -hmm. uh, which so many people are so confused, uh, <laughs> stream, what, what we have done to all the poor people who don't participate in the stream is they're like, what? Um, but we're getting, uh, we're getting a, what do we, we got a patch. And... So, so the, the first thing that we are, we are getting is, uh, oh, a sticker, a sticker yeah. pack and, mm -hmm. and we're going to theme it. We're gonna make it look like it belongs to the other sticker, sticker yeah. packs, so that it'll have sort of that anime style. The Chicken Scouts will get their own glyph that goes in the, mm -hmm. the circle area, and we'll figure out a motto. In fact, if people have ideas for mottos, just shoot them at us, because yeah. we might find one that we like, and that will become the motto. Yeah, someone um, suggested the Chromatic Chicken Scouts as the title. And, and we, we took it. Yeah, so, uh, but this is all you guys. Yeah. Um, so our, our next, our next Goal after that is I think when we hit 4.25, uh -huh. then um, we will do a what we're calling a merit patch, mm -hmm. um, and it's it'll be the same size as the uh, challenge coins. It's one yeah. and a half inch. It looks like a merit badge for Boy Scouts or mm -hmm. um, one of those things. And I don't know what it's going to be yet. Yeah, but it might be like chicken rain and not chicken wrangler, a troll wrangler, a troll wrangler, yeah. or great shell wrangler, well, or we probably need to have. If we're going to do this, like it needs to be this like um, theme toward expeditions to different um, Cosmere worlds. Right. Oh, yeah, that's right. Right. Is part should be part of this. Not all of it, but you know, um, basically the patch says, "I have I have visited Nalthus," meaning I have read this book or something. I don't know. You guys can decide on how how you want that to be. So, but that's that's. You know, it might be just the I have visited Roshar, which is the gimme that everyone who signs up Right. They're, they're from That's their Roshar. first it's their yeah. first patch. Yes. But we'll we'll see. So crazy idea. Mm -hmm. And shoot yeah. it down if you want. Okay. But but what if these originated with the Ahorn Eaters and our and our and our <laughs> our motto is like, you know, Ukapala Aawa o no wa or whatever, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. it, it's I don't know what that means. We went to other wor worlds and found and chickens. Ate their, and ate their food. Um I, I, I don't know. But yeah. then your your first level that's like tenderfoot mm -hmm. could be airsick lowlander. <laughs> <laughs> Let us know in the in the comments what you guys think and we'll have uh Isaac browse through these after yeah. the stream is done. Um, the, we will want to, we're probably going to add at least one more stretch goal. It will not be chicken scout themed, uh, because we've already <laughs> probably indulged yeah. ourselves too much. I think so. Um, we're trying, we need to find something that can go in the box of goodies we're sending that doesn't add a ton to the weight. Um, and, uh, that works pretty well. So one of the things I'm thinking, let us know what you think about this. We might add like a little pack of uh, five or 10 um, uh, book plates, um, depending on how much they cost to print and stuff, that are not signed by me. The goal is they're these, the from the library of sort of book plates mm -hmm. sort of things. Ex Libris. Um, that use the art from uh, from inside the, uh, the, the leather bound. Maybe either one of the archways, which would work pretty well. Mm, yeah. um, for for that because you know you want to be able to write your name on it or we do one of Steve's um, pieces. Let us know if that's something like my goal here. My worry is I don't want to just be adding things on that people are going to throw away, right? We want to add things on that you actually are legitimately excited about Here, getting. Here's an here's an idea. Yeah. We we have a um, what first oaths of the Knights Radiant poster by Gian Guo. Which mm. is really cool. I wonder if we could take elements from that and uh, use that as the book plates. Yeah, we totally could. No, you don't want your food. You want to come down. Yes, that's what you always want to do. You want to be part of everything, which is good. But <laughs> you want to, uh, oh, you want to go over and eat whatever Isaac's playing with. You see he has a pen. We have the poster room whenever you're ready. We have the, oh, the poster ah! room? Yeah, let's show the poster room. Jelly. So, how many are in there right now? Um, so, the last time I counted, which was about four or five days ago, we had 6,110. Um, okay. She says we have 6,110 um, as of a few days ago. <laughs> this used to be where, uh, where Dan Wells had his, um, his uh, typecast live stream. Where are you going? 
Where Pl- do you think plenty you of uh, writing excuses have been recorded yeah, in there as well. Yeah, a lot of writing excuses include recorded in there. But with the pandemic, uh, they moved out, and so we had this extra room, and it is now filled with posters. What you have to stand right in front. Well, where do you think you're going? Mm-hmm. Where do you think you're going? Huh? You're welcome to fly around if you want. We're still trying to teach him how to fly. Um, he came from the, uh, the breeders with his wings clipped, and so we've had to wait for those to grow in and start encouraging him uh, to fly. He's getting more and more bold. I'm sure it'll be pretty soon. Don't buy my ears. But where do you want to go? Where do you, do you want to eat the camera? Is that what you want to do? Chromatic Chicken Cat Scout Badge. Camera eating. Using the force. He's using yeah. the force. By the way, some people in the chat, mm-hmm. uh, and I haven't verified this, on there? Um, have said that your Kickstarter is the 33rd most successful or funded uh, Kickstarter oh, of all time. Wow. I didn't think we'd make that list. Uh, That's pretty cool. That is way cool. Thank you, everyone. Where is okay, it? Not you think verified, you're going? but I'll look Where that do up you tomorrow. Going? Yeah, come on. Yeah, you don't want scritches. Where do you want to go? You know that I'm going to try to put you back on your thing. Um, we could go into some more ideas that we've talked about. So yeah, so book plates, book plates. So uh, book book plates. We've talked about. I think that's a pretty cool idea. Um, little art prints or postcards. Postcards yeah. could be postcards cool. Postcards could be cool um, because those would fit, and we could use like the full color art. Um, maybe we could get Howard to let's use that for the end yeah, pages. Yeah, he's, or he's something. already on board with yeah. with uh, that. So. Mm-hmm. He's yeah. even said that he'd be willing to do new art for us if we mm. wanted to do a, an art print or postcards or yeah. something. Um, the question is, how much do people want art prints? They're already getting an art print and a um, and a poster. Yeah. Um, so maybe postcards, but do people still send postcards? I don't know. Come on, come on. A welcome to Roshar. Yeah, we could, we could do an actual, you know... Roshar postcard, kind of like these uh, visit yeah, Tatooine or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you know I'm going to put you away. Oh, I know. He gets so grouchy when I make him go places. Come on. Come on. You need to be better about... Oh, yeah. <laughs> you were going to go, and then you saw that where I was putting you. You need to be where everyone is. He's still a baby. So. Some people have mentioned car decals, raffle bookmarks. There we go. Okay. I'm writing all of these down. Yep. Yeah. Those are all pretty good suggestions. So we'll, we'll see what we can come up with um, and what we can fit. And uh, basically, if you like one of these ideas more than the other, let us know in the comments because mm-hmm. um, uh, what you guys actually want to get will heavily influence what we choose to make. Yeah. Um, and when you get all the stuff, um, getting us feedback on what you liked, what your favorite parts were and, and things like that, it's also going to be really helpful for Words Radiance. Um, we want to be delivering cool stuff that people actually want to get. Yeah, that's that's a really big thing there. Mm-hmm. We that's one of the reasons why we decided to roll the poster is yeah we want these things to be used. Mm-hmm. You know, for for some people, you know, one one man's trash is another man's treasure, as they yeah. say, right? Mm-hmm. So your mileage may vary, but we do try to make this something that we think is cool, um, and that somebody on our team is like, yeah, I would totally use that. Yeah. So. Yeah, our big fear with the posters is that people would get them and be like, "Oh, cool," and then and then toss them. Off they go. Um, because you know, folded, um, and things like that. When we saw them, we're like, "Yeah, I wouldn't hang that up folded. It'll have a crease right on Kaladin's face." Yeah. So, um, so yeah, just uh, keep us in the loop. Uh, we are really glad that those of you who just didn't want to pay for shipping for all that swag, um, that it was a big deal to you, spoke up, mm-hmm. um, so that we could have the tier. Uh, that have the gift card instead. Uh, that was uh, that was uh, that was extremely useful. But also telling us don't fold the posters was extremely useful. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So uh, I had an idea. Mm. Epic bookmark. Yeah, epic bookmark. Because okay, if anybody, if for those who don't know, if somebody can find an epic bookmark, I can put it on the thing. Yeah. So back when, and we should do this. Well, we I honestly. Found an original one. Yeah, we honestly. Th- this is. If you say you don't want it, we won't do it. Yeah. But when when the Way of Kings came out ten mm-hmm. years ago, we came up with this thing that was epic bookmarks, and they're we've like, been giving away bookmarks before of my other right. books. A very common thing to give away. And but they, they were a little smaller, and 
the this, book was this book was epic, right? Double sized book. We thought we're gonna make a double sized book. So I made we made four inches by nine inch bookmarks. Yep. And uh, they're kind of big. They're big like this. And I, I think we've done one for most of the uh, the Way of Kings or the Stormlight books since then. Maybe not all of them, but yeah. um, we, we have done them intermittent, mm -hmm. intermittent. And we have the design on that. We could really easily get a bunch of those printed. Yeah. Uh, that's a, that's a pretty good idea. Or or we take new art mm -hmm. from the the book and uh, mm -hmm. design something that. Make I kind of like the idea of just giving because so few people got those. Yeah. Right. Reissue it. Uh, just reissue the, yeah. the the book one one. Uh, again, let us know in the yeah. comments what you'd be interested yeah. in. But it's kind of a little piece of our lore mm -hmm. um, that we we have these things. And and where we would be printing like ten thousand of these. Yeah. We can make those really nice. Yeah. We might be able to put like foil on them. Um, like on the, so this is what they original, here, oh, we've got several of them. So this is the original one. So on the, the front, we, uh, and we could change the design a little bit yeah. however we wanted. This is back when Kara and I were running Inkwing, so it, it's branded Inkwing. Mm -hmm. We would brand it Dragonsteel or something. Um, but Before I, I hired Kara and Isaac, they handled my merchandising through their own store yeah. that they had started up. Uh, which was, was fun. That was when we did like the Alimantic tables and um, some t-shirts and things. And Inkwing, and this was our our, our little uh, Batwing Pegasus, whose name was Devin, down in the corner over there. Poor Devin. He hasn't shown up for a while. Yeah, he got retired. He got retired. That's okay. We've got Magellan now. So th <laughs> this is one of the ones that we've had. And we could make this a little thicker. We could make it... Um, a little bit more uh, kind of that soft touch and we could put foil on it make it really cool and if if people like that that's something we could do for the next one as well but theme it toward the uh, light weavers yeah and here, here's just some other ones we did we did this one for Oathbringer it was partly an advertisement Tor helped us out with these yep but then then on the back we had the color um, map of Roshar we did one of these for um, Arcanum Unbounded, and that was also the year that Book 5 of Alcatraz came oh, out. Yeah. So we had the Free Kingdoms map on the back side. I still love that map. Isaac, so, you did such a good job with oh, that map. Thanks. I actually finished the original, finally. It's in my office. Um, so yeah, so that, that's another idea. We could, do, uh, some, uh, we could do a fun, epic bookmark and really go wild with the effects on it. Yep. So let us know. Let us know which things you like the most. If you like book plates, you like bookmark, you like postcards. Mm -hmm. um, if you want more sticker sheets, we can do more, more stickers. of those. Those are pretty easy to do because yeah. we, we have Ben uh, McSweeney on staff now. Um, yeah. And so we just kind of set him on cool projects and let yeah. him work. So uh, he, he was talking to me about taking more of the characters from the, the Stormlight Archive and just making like a sheet full of chibis. <laughs> <laughs> that, that we haven't maybe already seen on the other um, Orders of Knights radio. You guys are going to love his wit. Oh, it's the so wit great. is great. All right, yeah. do you want to do your tricks? Do you need some tricks? So that's another idea. Use the force. Good bird. Yeah, you just, wanna, you just want to get the treat as a way to get down. Oh, no, you actually want the treat. Okay. Yeah. You should try that one more time because he actually walks just out of frame. Walk just walks just out of frame. Yeah, I will. I, yeah. He, uh, he loves doing his tricks because he gets attention when he does them. But he's not hugely hungry, as evidenced by the fact that he is not eating his basket of treats down here that has all sorts of fruit and vegetables. Um, one of the nice things about having a macaw is uh, they are perfectly happy eating um, you know, the ends of the cucumber that you have chopped off because your kids won't eat them. Or, you know, the... Uh, the pieces of uh, bell pepper that weren't aesthetically pleasing enough to go in the uh, <laughs> the dinner or whatnot. Um, all right, you want to do it again? They want to see your tricks. Come here. All right, use the force. No, that's the other one. There you go. Good bird. Yeah. Yeah. Other birds wave, but that's not what we do in this household. Uh, what else we got, uh, Adam? Um, some people have said sorry to Isaac for making you work so much overtime. Oh, I, I didn't say anything about overtime. Mm. Are you yeah. guys just guessing? This is, this is the uh, 
the the problem uh, or the the burden my entire team has to deal with is, as you can imagine, I am quite the idea guy. Um, <laughs> yes, they're giggling over there um, because I'll be like, "Hey, let's do this," and they're all like, uh, "How are we going to do that?" And I'm like, "I don't know. Figure it out." <laughs> I, I think the big thing on the Kickstarter oh, was. Yes, you do. We're, we're doing this on a stormlight year. Yes. <laughs> Which makes sense, but yeah. it's like, those, those years are busy already. Stacking a lot. Yep. Mm. But, uh, yeah. Think about how e much easier it'll be next time. Yeah. <laughs> what? You need, to, you need to do? All right. Dragon. Yeah. Anytime, we're, we're getting him, we're wanting to eventually put his wings all the way out, but anytime he'll move his wings and respond to that, that's how we're starting. We will slowly then hopefully capture that and move him into holding his wings out. But for now, as long as he'll respond to the verbal command, which he doesn't always do, then it's good. Yeah, I know you want to get down. You've made it quite clear that you want to get down. But when you get down, all you do is bite my ears because you're so excited about everybody. Yeah. Um. So Pavel says, a number of times during these live streams, you have mentioned mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings as an example of a book adopted to screen. Yes. What is your opinion of how well Peter Jackson did with adopting the beloved story to the big screen? I think he did an incredible job. Um, granted, it's in some ways an impossible job, right? Because um, so many people love uh, Lord of the Rings and so many people have strong opinions on how it should be done. And, um, you know, you at least know you had Christopher Lee on staff um, at, who uh, would, would frequently explain to uh, Peter Jackson what, what really should happen because he is himself a Tolkien scholar and a friend of Tolkien's. But um, for me, as an adaptation for me, they were near perfect. Um, they work beautifully. I watch them and have, like, there's almost nothing I can find to complain about at all. Um, I have to stretch to even co complain about the things I do, which are more, less complaints and more. Here's something I learned. Um, I really like how he adapted them. I really like um, the casting. Um, all right, we'll send, uh, we'll send Emily to come get him. He's being a little too excited. It's about his bedtime anyway. So let me text Emily. Um, uh, yeah, we'll see if she, if she responds, um, but yeah, yeah, okay, you can get down for a few more minutes. What? No? What are you doing? You're just excited. Okay, you don't even really want to get down anymore. You just want to talk. Yeah, he gets this way about this time of night. He really just likes talking and doing that. Um, a lot of times because it's sundown, but... What? Everybody's excited. You weren't here last time. They got mad. Now you're gonna, you're gonna be like really loud and they're gonna be like, oh man, don't bring that macaw back. Yeah? What? <laughs> what? What? What is it that's freaking me out? You're both acting like you want me to get you and you're acting like you don't. Which one is it? Oh, you just want the pen? <laughs> is that the whole, th the whole time? Can you train him to sign your name? <laughs> and that's what the whole time was about. You really just wanted the pen. <laughs> that one wasn't even used up yet. Okay, someone warn me if he manages to get the, uh, the top off. We don't want him to bite the ink thing in half. Um, that's what it was. He wanted the pen. Um, so, anyway, uh, I love the Lord of the Rings adaptations. I just showed them to my children uh, just uh, last month. Um, and man, do they hold up, uh, the CGI is, you know, 20 years old now, but Andy Serkis just makes it work. He's in a grouchy, well, not a grouchy move. He wanted my pen really badly, we discovered. Um, and that's why he was, uh, he was acting, acting up. Yeah. He's dipping the pen in his water. He dumps everything in his water because he finds it more fun. It's just a normal thing. Okay. Uh, and you're going to come over? I'll come like 7.30. Okay, great. I have to feed great. the boys dinner first. So. Say goodbye to Jello. You can take his pen. Oh.
Uh, no, he can't. That's if you give him the pen, just take the ink cartridge out beforehand. Yeah. Um. So. So. All right. Well, he's got his pen. She's taking it with him. Um. Our chromatic chicken is off on his way, uh, to bed. Uh, he likes going to bed now. He used to hate it, but now he's in, uh, in a room with a mirror. And he loves to, uh, we have the lights go down automatically, and he loves to talk to the, the bird in the mirror for a few minutes. Um, he hasn't, sometimes mirrors will make a, uh, a parrot get really territorial, which is why it can be dangerous to have them, but he hasn't manifest that yet. Uh, he just loves saying hello to the bird in the mirror and uh, calling him a good bird. Uh, so... <laughs> yes, that's his, that's his new thing. He realized when we say good bird, we give him a treat. And so now he will do his tricks, call himself a good bird, and then look at us for a treat. Because he <laughs> figures that's, that's what we do, right? He's taking over treating he actually, himself. He, get, he says dragon, he lifts up his wings, he says good bird, and then he looks and opens up his mouth for a treat. So <laughs> He cut the middleman out of the equation, the human being, and just just does it. Um, so, anyway, um, what do you think, Isaac? What do you think of the Lord of the Rings adaptation? Were so, you one of the ones that was super angry that there's no Tom Bombadil? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not. I, I I, mean, that's a fun little aside, right? But, but even in the book, it's kind of like s- slows the book down, right? So, I don't know. I, I, I enjoyed it. Hmm, what does Master think of the... Adaptations. I don't know. That's my Gollum impression. Pretty good Gollum. I've been doing that with my kids, though, because we showed it to them as well, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's weird. Um, Nice Gollum is trying... Nice Smeagol is trying to teach evil Smeagol how to be creative. And my my kids have fun with that one. But I'm not going to do it on air because... Mm. Now I'm all nervous about that. It works really well in front of my kids. I think I told you guys when my mom visited that Lord of the Rings is the first like fantasy film property we managed to get her to go to and enjoy. Um, and the thing that hooked her, she's not a, a fantasy person. She reads my books because they're mine. Um, but, you know, she's an accountant. In fact, it was funny. She called me today, and apparently she hasn't gotten anything done all day because being an accountant and really liking numbers, she sat and refreshed the Kickstarter every 15 minutes um, to just the pure enjoyment of watching numbers go up is uh, it's just a simple joy my mother has and so but Lord of the Rings were the first fantasy anything that I got her to enjoy and it was all Gollum uh, she w- really wanted to know if little Smeagol was going to be good or not um, <laughs> so so uh, overall those the movies and the storytelling really held up. Even with the sort of dated CGI, it yeah. still really held up for yeah. me. And I and my kids watched them and enjoyed them, or seemed to enjoy them. Um, Again, Andy Serkis is so expressive yeah, and so powerful he's in that really role good. that it, it transcends the CGI. Yeah. I'm, and I would say that they... Sorry. They put so much effort into making the CGI look great yeah. that it looks better than a lot of recent movies with CGI. Looks so better than some of the effects in the Hobbit movies, yeah. which yes. is ironic. Uh, but yes. So my, my, my only complaint, and I don't want to do this to bash on it, but mm-hmm. it's just that I, I noticed that I complained it ab- about it enough mm. while watching them that my kids started pointing it out. And that is that there, there's just a lot of fake out deaths. Yeah, there are. And that that was the that was maybe my overall my big complaint was I, I think there were just too many fake out deaths for the fa- for the sake we of drama. We all have problems with that though, right? Yeah. That's just too 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 tempting a prospect. George has had that problem. You know, it's that yeah. it creates so much drama. Like I I've, I've talked about that. I think it's the big mistake I made in Words of Radiance. Right. With yeah. with, uh, with the fake out death that happens there. Um, the um, the the one that happens at the in the first quarter ish, and then is proven to be a fake out at the end because, um, like for those who haven't heard the story, um, the beta readers are reading it and they didn't believe the character had died, which is actually the right response, right? I should have wanted them to be suspicious, so it wasn't a fake out because there's nothing to really be gained except for a powerful emotion at the uh, at the beginning. Sometimes there's a lot to be gained. Um, like I have no problem with Gandalf's death and resurrection, right? Um, even though you could you could point out like this is, um, you know this this weakens the death of Gandalf. But really, the death of Gandalf is more about removing Gandalf from being able to help them 
while the while the the fellowship is shattering right like that's the reason it's there and that's the reason it's powerful and works and coming back as Gandalf the White is so wonderful both in the Tolkien lore and how it's handled in the film and how Ian McKellen just sells that role so well um, that like I think it is um, it is much better with than without that that was my I would say yeah. that's my favorite one because mm -hmm. I, I it's been a long time since I've read it, but I think yeah. that was in the original. It was in the original. And also, Gandalf is a magical character. Mm -hmm. I can buy this a little bit more, right? It's like, oh, well, I don't understand the the mechanics of his magic, but something mm -hmm. cool happened, and magic happened, and Gandalf is awesome, and it increases his his yeah. mystery, right? But um, but where the reason I changed it and shouldn't have is just I'm like, well, I want that emotional punch. I want them to believe me. I can prove that I'm a good enough writer <laughs> to make them believe, right? And then, but that was more about ego on my part than it was about what the story actually needed. Yeah. Um, and so it's really hard. Um, like, uh, I know a lot of people uh, complain about George's work doing this because George's work is low magic or magic as mystery and so bringing characters back to life kind of undermines one of the big selling points and it, it's just really hard not to do in fact most movies you'll watch will do this in small ways like every you know couple of, not minutes but every scene or two you'll have some sort of is he dead is he not dead uh because it works so well for kind of plotting and pacing but it is something you need to be careful with um more careful i think than authors are but you learn lessons as you as you write, and um, the only one in Lord of the Rings that the films is the 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 Aragorn one. That, that one. Um, it just feels like they don't use it for anything. Yeah. Um, and um, granted, him like holding onto his horse has really cool. Followed by that scene where he like, you know, yeah. um, it, it leads yeah. to some cool imagery, <laughs> but doesn't really accomplish much. No. Um, so I don't know. Our, our youngest, though, when, when Aragorn got dragged over that cliff, yeah. he's like, oh no, Aragorn! And we're like... <laughs> yeah. it, it worked for her. Mm. Those movies are great, though. That's, uh, that's my answer to you. Um, totally fine if, uh, as a big Tolkien fan, uh, you don't respond to them the way that I did, but I love those films, even still. Uh, you would be hard pressed to find um, better adaptations, right? I mean, The Princess Bride is up there, but it cheats because it has William Goldman as the screenwriter and as the the book writer. Mm -hmm. um, like, and he was a screenwriter before he wrote the uh, wrote the book and wrote it obviously with the intention that he could make a screenplay of it if he wanted to, but. That one's a pretty brilliant adaptation too, but Lord of the Rings, just an amazing, uh, an amazing job. Sorry, we went off on that like way too long. Well, someone asked a related question. Yeah. Uh, you've asked it in previous, or answered it in previous streams, but it's might okay. as well yeah. just talk mm -hmm. about it. Um, this question's from Rebecca, and she wants to know if Lord of the Rings uh, magic system is hard or soft because she was having a debate recently with someone. So I think Lord of the Rings does a brilliant thing by using both a hard system and a soft system. Uh, you can watch my writing lectures for more on this, but uh, it, it it shows off the strengths of both types of systems. I consider the ring as it's presented in the films, not necessarily the whole lore of it, um, but the ring as it's presented in the books and the films as a hard magic system. Uh, you have this thing that has this specific effect, it has this specific cost, and um, it has you know this specific um, power associated with it. And indeed, it's very consistent, very reliable. Um, the characters are able to use the ring to solve problems, but then that causes other problems because of the costs that are, that are weighed into it. And the very climax of the trilogy spins on the costs of this magic system, which is just great. Um, it just fill, ticks all the boxes that I want for a hard magic system. But Gandalf and a lot of the rest of the magic in Lord of the Rings is a soft magic system. It exists for the reason a soft magic system generally is good in a story in that it decreases a sense of wonder. It decreases, in many ways, the um, protagonist's control over the world around them. 
Uh, it makes it a mystical and fantastical place and uh, is associated in different ways with different types of storytelling. And uh, Peter Jackson really nailed this when he makes you even uncertain a lot of times when magic, when Gandalf is using magic, if he actually used magic. It's like, did the clouds just part or is Gandalf shooting laser light at them? We don't really know. Um, and it's just really well handled. Um, and so the balance between those two systems is part of what makes Lord of the Rings world building brilliant for me, right? I'm a magicism guy. There are lots of different reasons people like Lord of the Rings world building, but for me, that is one of the things that is just really good. Um, and I often bring up Pat Rothfuss is another person who has a really good example um, in the King Killer Chronicles of both a hard system and a soft system, both doing what they do best um, to <coughs> enhance his story. Um, this next question is for Isaac. Uh, they want to know how you decide what scenes get depicted in the books. So, uh, with the Alcatraz books, I would write, I, I, I read it, I would fill out a list, the editor read it and fill out a list of different scenes that we would want. And then, and then the artist would do that as well, and then we would discuss and kind of narrow it down to, from there. Um, on these leather-bound books, I, I will usually approach an artist, and I may have a scene in mind, and I might, if the, if the artist is already a fan, I will ask them, are there any scenes that you particularly like? Um, and, and we'll go from there. Um, but I can't do that with every artist because they all want to, they all want to paint Dalinar, um, mm -hmm. freeing the slaves, um, things like that. So I, I, beyond that, I start looking at moments that haven't been depicted um, before, but ought to be depicted. Um, one of the examples in, in this one was uh, Navani's painting of the Thathglyph. We hadn't seen that done before. Um, and of course, about the same time, Brotherwise was doing their own version of it as well. And so ours and theirs came out at the same time, and they're both fantastic. Um, another one of those that's like that is we, we painted, we had Micah Epstein paint um, the heralds leaving their swords behind. Mm. And then um, Brotherwise also did a fantastic rendition of that using our, our canonical uh, blade designs, which turned out really nice as well. And it's, it was so cool to see the same scene uh, painted in different ways by different artists. But that, that's one of the things I do. And of course, there, there are these candy bar moments that you want to, to show somehow in the book. Uh, one of the challenges with these books is that we already had like 30 pieces of art in them. Um, in the in the form of grayscale pieces that we have for yeah. these these books we've spread them out to blue uh, they're two color pieces so where in do the I leather bound you're saying they're two color pieces they're two the color same pieces artwork yeah that is in the other one except yeah. for one replacement right? there's there's one replacement yeah. um, which I, I wish I knew the the Latin phrase I wrote mm -hmm. it down once but it means no no yeah anyway there there was one piece you'll see it you'll mm -hmm. know which one it is um, we'll talk about that one. Um, but then we, we do have a few new ones. Uh, ben McSweeney did a uh, Sadius's Bridges piece. We wanted to. Yeah. I, th I think this is one that we probably should have had in the original book anyway. I've had a lot of fans anyway. say, I wish you'd put this in. How do the bridges work? Yeah. The bridge crews, how do they span the chasms? What is the actual mechanism of how to visualize this? And so when we were doing this, I said, hey, can we get this one in? Yeah. So we had... Uh, we had uh, ben do up a version of that. Yep. So so Ben has that. We we also in the uh, trade paperback of the Way of Kings, Ben did a piece of the cryptics. Yep. Um, and uh, we have taken that and added that into this one as a canonical piece uh, by Shalon. Um, and then we have um, a new a new um, a replacement for one of the old pieces. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, the challenge was trying to figure out where do the four color pieces go in between all of these two color pieces that we have and and really spacing it out through the book and but that, that's sort of the process I also go to Brandon and say hey are there any scenes you want to see and um, and if there's something that 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 he feels really strongly about then we we find somebody to do that so it's kind of approaching it from all these different angles and then narrowing it down because there's always more pieces then we have time or funds to do. 
um, or even spaces. I mean, we only have so many. You, these have to go in between the signature pages. Uh, and so you can only do so many of these inside the book or it starts to affect the integrity of the book. You know, it would be like bowing out like this. Um, is this a good time to show another piece? Since um, we're just talking sure. about the yeah, art? Yeah, go ahead. So I'm going to show you one of the chapter headings by Jian Guo. I hope I'm saying his name right. I don't know. I don't speak... Chinese, but he's been so great to work with, uh, an excellent fellow and a great, uh, just fantastic artist. Yeah, you guys should all go look up his Tolkien uh, art yeah. uh, on, on DeviantArt. It's just amazing. His uh, handle over there is like Breathing2000, or mm. something like that. So you can see what's going on there. And if you want to, Adam, uh, we can show the, uh, we have one of uh, Ben's pieces you can see how we've done the black and the blue together. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, on, so that's, and it, it might be a little bit dark in here, so it might be a little bit harder to. Uh, and those archways turned out so well. They are great. Yeah. He, he did a fantastic job re reinterpreting <clears throat> all of the heralds and. Yep. Which he had already done once um, yeah. for his Way of Kings uh, Chinese cover. Yep, which um, uh, is in the gallery. Yep, as is it? well. Great. Yep, it's in the. We have. Yeah. These um, also have the galleries at the front of the foreign edition. Of the foreign yeah. edition. So on, on volume one, just because you're going to want to know what you're getting, right? Um, volume one, we have uh, a selection of some of the uh, foreign covers. Here's that's a, one of my favorites. That's the French cover. Yeah, I love so, it. The French cover, then we have over here the uh, the UK cover, mm -hmm. and then the French was one was uh, was two volumes was two volumes. So then we we had Caledon on the other one. We have Chalon at the top of uh, Carbranth, mm. which Just I love so as well. Great. And then uh, we have um, Jian Guo's um, Chinese cover. Yep, for, for mainland the Chinese, Chinese. Main, mainland mm -hmm. Chinese. Uh, uh, Chinese complex, I think, is mainland. Yeah, I, th I think this one's considered mm -hmm. complex. Uh, we, we added color maps at the beginning so that you could refer back to them. Mm -hmm. And then this is the Russian one. Oh, yeah. Which we are very, very grateful to Azbuka Atticus, who is the publisher for that, who uh, let us uh, license that. And it's by Sergei Shikin. Probably getting the names wrong. But the, uh, the other... Ben is asking uh, for you to show them the bridge page. Show them the bridge page? Okay. Oh, Ben uh, McSweeney? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Let me find it here. I think it's, uh, in, it's in volume one. While you're getting all that ready, maybe I should open some fan mail. There you go. Well, let's, let's do a fan mail. Uh, so, uh, this is from Jake. Jake has written me fan mail and said... Um, so thank you, Jake, by the way, I love getting fan mail. Uh, what was your revision process like for Elantris before you got an editor's attention? Um, all of this has got me wondering what been on behind the scenes with Elantris to make the story that, that broke you into the business. That's an excellent question, uh, Jake. Um, and I will read the rest of this later. They highlight certain things for me to read, um, on air, so if you want to have a question you really want to get answered, you're more likely to get it answered if you send uh, us fan mail of it. Um, email we don't get to as often, do we, Adam? Um, we we try to, but email is the hard one, which is weird. We should get to that, but I'm most likely to get to Reddit. I get to about half the questions asked me on Reddit, um, and so um, so what went on behind the scenes with Launchers? So the way that I worked. Um, and Ben, we'll, we'll show this art in a sec. Uh, the way I worked back then, that's a really weird time in my life because I uh, had made a large group of friends and acquaintances at the university working on the science fiction magazine there, uh, which I had risen to become editor of. And about this time, um, for, for the longest while, I didn't share my books with people. Um, I was just, I don't know, uh, self-conscious or whatnot. Um, but by the time I had written several of them, I was getting pretty confident in my writing and I started sharing them around with people. And, um, they started to get a lot of popularity, um, in that little group on campus. Uh, 
I started for the first time having people I didn't know be requesting the next book and borrowing them from friends. Uh, printouts that I had printed at like the local Kinko's or whatever um, and spiral bound. And what I would do is I'd print these off and the way I got feedback before I had an editor was first I did a writing group, which is still my same writing group today, actually. Uh, and they would look at it chapter by chapter, week by week and give me feedback on that. And then I would bind it like I said in a spiral bound version and then I would just hand it around. I'd say, okay, take a turn reading this, sign your name on the front page, pick a color of pencil or pen that no one has used before, always write in that color so I can refer to, you know, who made these comments and go through the book and just write down, I, I gave some instructions at the beginning, write down your feelings, your responses, your emotions. I wasn't looking for fixes, I was just looking for how people reacted. And I would get 50 people reading these books. They'd get passed around and I would even lose track uh, of them till they eventually found their way back to me with all these marks all over it where people were responding to what each other said. And this was just so I could get a feeling for how people were reacting and responding to my writing. And uh, that's the process I used for Elantris. Um, I did several revisions where I would send it out around again and get people's feedback and things like that. Uh, like I said, it was a very strange part of my life because I started to feel like a real writer um, in that I started to have a fandom and started to uh, have people reading my books that I didn't know. And yet I was still working a graveyard shift at a hotel for my job, right? I was not a professional writer, but I acted like one um, in basically all regards and respects. And, um, you know, this is when I went through, I talk about it a lot, like, what I went through before I wrote Way of Kings, where I was really uncertain if this was the career I wanted. And I got through all of this stuff and I had experiences with fans and whatnot before I sold anything, which meant when I sold something, one of the biggest advantages I've had in my career is I hit the ground running. I already knew what it was like to go through. I mean, I'd written 13 novels. I knew what it was like to go through the writing process. I knew what it was like to take feedback, even though it was hard. I'd gotten over the idea of sharing my work with people I didn't know and receiving criticism from people I didn't know. And I knew what it was like to interact with a community who was reading my books. And um, in a lot of ways I had a pre-publication professional experience as a writer, which was super handy for me. Uh, a lot of writers, uh, particularly who do well with their opening books, get a strong sort of imposter syndrome or performance anxiety uh, situation going on. And I dealt with all that in the 10 years before I sold. And so once I did sell, um, I already had like these systems in place to deal with all the, the sort of idiosyncrasies that uh, that often strike artists and so it was a real big advantage to me uh, in my career and it's why you know we are approaching this this is book number 45 or something like that I think Rhythm um, of War is listed listed as 46, 46. maybe um, yeah Peter could tell us um, uh, not all of those are published obviously that counts the 12 books that I wrote that didn't get published mm -hmm. uh, Elantris of those 13 being the one that did though you can read number 13 right now Way of Kings Prime. If you guys have any questions about that, I'm perfectly happy to talk about it um, on stream, but you've only had it for a day, so I'm assuming not many of you have finished it. It is a snapshot of who I was the last days before I knew I was going to get published. Um, a Mistborn I wrote knowing I had sold a book. Uh, the Way of Kings Prime I wrote not knowing if I ever would. So I, I have a, a kind of a fun story if you mm. want yeah, to hear it, it about. This is... This goes back to your your binders full of uh, mm. of uh, notes and, and critiques from people that got passed around. Uh, Brandon and I ha have a, a mutual friend that you had loaned the Way of Kings to, and um, in one of these binders, and then we went and helped her move from her apartment and. It was used as a doorstop, literally opening the door while we were helping her move out of the apartment. I'm, and I, I recognized it as one of your books. But you didn't know me back then. Yeah. Right? Well, not, no, this was, yeah. What? Oh. Yeah. Th at this point, yeah. Okay. 
I thought this was before. Oh, so this was after I had gotten published and stuff. This, this was probably the summer after Elantris was published. Okay, okay. But, but she had asked to read uh, The Way of Kings Prime. Right. And um, anyway, I found it as one of the doorstops because she had been reading it and then moved in the middle of it. And I, and I pointed it out to you and you're like, oh, that's just half the book. Yeah. Because it was so big, it, yeah. it had to go into two binders. They are big binders. We, we still have, have some of those. Yeah, we still have those. We still have them somewhere, don't we? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. One of these days, <laughs> one of the one of the things like we eventually, who knows if we'll ever actually do this. We eventually want to have a place that people can come pick up books they buy locally, so they don't have to have them shipped. Um, and maybe we'll put out some of those those relics uh, in whatever location this is that people can browse through them and see these these old uh, old books with everyone's writing on them and stuff. Uh, another question uh, for Isaac for the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. um, people want you to go over how the add-ons will work. Um, okay. Maybe maybe uh. Or maybe get Kara over Kara, here. Let's you have talk about Kara come over here as well. So uh, I can get us started while she's coming over. The add-ons. Um, we found out late in the game. Brandon mentioned this on a earlier uh, live stream that. Uh, you can't do the add-ons until after the Kickstarter is over. So at the end of the Kickstarter, we will be sending a questionnaire your way, which will ask you what order of Knights Radiant do you want if you had one of the tiers that um, gets you Knights Radiant swag. Um, but it will also ask you what your current address is, uh, which we will stay on top of with all the different waves of shipping. Mm -hmm. But it also... Um, will give you the chance to buy things out of the add-on store. Yes. So we have them listed. Sorry, I'll try to talk about um, We have them listed on the Kickstarter page. Um, and as uh, we did have some people ask that as we add, like, the chicken scout yeah. stuff, we, we will add that, that on yeah. for the add-ons yeah. also. Um, mm -hmm. We actually build the add-on store during the campaign, which um, I learned. Um, but we'll be using backer kit. And they they were highly recommended to us, and so you'll get emails from Kickstarter and Backer Kit. So just be sure to check your email. Don't yep. give us your email that your spam goes to. Yeah. So Kickstarter is working on a way that you can hopefully do these add-ons yes. in the middle of a campaign in the future. Yeah. But for right now, it has to be at the end. You add them on, but we can put most of you know we can like group their shipping together and things like that. And so yes, that's what we're hoping to be yeah. able to do through the backer kit so that when yeah. you add an add-on it should just go in the same box, box. as your tier stuff yes so that's and yeah. if you haven't ordered from that tier yet you'll have to pay or ordered from that that whatever that thing is getting shipped you may have to or you know yes. um but like if you order a uh a, 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 the whole thing of stickers right? right we can fit that in your box yes. right because we don't have to we do we are not do we not have to worry about weight on those we do it depends yes. on the box but for the most part yes we have to worry about okay. it okay so um, so it depends, light things yeah. we'll be fine with um yes. but like if someone adds all 10 coins is that going to increase the weight that will increase the weight yeah. and depending on what's already in their box will yeah. determine whether it puts it over um, this mainly has to do with international. There's mm -hmm. a there's this big four pound line, and mm -hmm. if it's under four pounds, it's a lot cheaper. And then the minute you go over four pounds, it's just more expensive. And so as long as we can keep the extras under four pounds, it shouldn't be a problem. But the minute you go over four pounds, it, okay. the, the shipping will increase. Yes. So we will try to be very clear about yes, that yes. Um, because yeah, international shipping. Uh, just, just, uh, just a beast. Yeah. Um, we've tried to figure out ways, um, like, um, to make it easier. Um, like we really wish we could work with some bookstores in Europe yeah. and things, but getting them books is just crazy expensive even still. It's because mm -hmm. they're so heavy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if you sent a pallet that's 500, like a pallet of t-shirts would be yeah. about maybe 300, maybe mm -hmm. 400 pounds. But when we ship... Leather bound, we're talking 1,200 to 1,400 pounds. Yeah. These are not light And things. just a pallet, and they're big books. And so you think, oh, a pallet's a ton. It's not very many. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. we've looked into, like, if we sent a pallet, how much would it be? And it mm -hmm. just doesn't save that much on shipping. It doesn't, actually. Um, it's actually more expensive. Yeah. 
Um, so if, if people have suggestions, one suggestion that someone wrote that I thought was interesting was finding out, because Book Depository does free shipping, yeah. if there's a way to get them to Book Depository cheaply, yeah. um, which is kind of like an international version of Amazon that ships all around the world with free shipping. Um, but we, we definitely would be open to trying to find ways to do this. Um, the trick is, like, we would, like, the only thing that seems reasonable would be to print them in Europe. But that has all of its own issues, like how much is a print of a print run are we going to do? And how much is the cost increased because we're printing 500 instead of 5,000? Right. And who distributes them? How do we get them to people? And uh, how, do we, how do we stay on top of quality and, and yep. things like that? So uh, press check. Well, I'm okay with that. Can I fly to Europe for press check? Yeah, why yeah, don't you take me with yeah. you? <laughs> any 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 chance to get to Germany, Isaac will take. Um, but so we're we're open to suggestions. But so far, a lot of the things we've looked at just end up costing around the same as just shipping. Yeah, just it just them. they're just really expensive, um, yeah. and you can't really print on demand these um, in small print runs like you can some other things. Like T-shirts can kind of be printed on demand right. uh, it, with the right thing, and you could just yeah. So we're trying. We're sorry. And EU That's right. They, I, I, would, I can't go to the EU right now. Oh, yeah, we way. can't go to the EU no. right now. But, but they, when they let me back in, yes. I will be there. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm, I'm, and on a related subject, people are wondering why you're not wearing masks. They are married. And yeah, they are married. Household, so. yeah. yeah, if I'm going to get sick from her, I've already gotten sick from her. <laughs> mm -hmm. or, you got, or you from me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. God. I so, am six feet from them. So. At least. At least. Yeah. Ten. Yep. Yeah. You got a good distance so, cool. so yeah. other people are requesting to see the yeah. art now okay let's yeah. uh, let's well, show this over. off then so thank you kara oh anytime so ben who did this piece is asking to see it and it's we're kind of uh you know showing off art in a room where the light's not shining on it isn't ideal we should probably in updates coming forward yeah we'll just get scans of these and we'll get we'll uh, i'll post some scans yeah. of these so you don't need um, to screenshot it right no. now we'll get them up in the next few days and and also another thing that i'll be putting up as the kickstarter goes on is we'll show you what the back of the coins are going to look yeah. like we'll show you what the other patches look like brandon's seen a lot of these we um, might show you the back of the wit coin we yeah probably <laughs> there's a chance we'll just wait for that yeah. one to be a surprise when we're, they we're, we're still uh we're, we're, we're still working with the uh, yeah. the coin people on that one to see what is what is possible. What is, what is, yeah. So anyway, you're gonna like it. Mm. Um, another question? Uh, yes, um, and you'll probably have to repeat this. Yes. They're looking for s biggest pieces of advice on how to develop characters. Biggest pieces of advice on how to develop characters. Um, well, watch my YouTube lectures because I will go into it in depth. Uh, the biggest things I learned was to start treating every character like they saw themselves as the protagonist of their own story and that I really needed to see them as a protagonist of their own life's story even if they weren't the main protagonist of the main story when I started doing that um, my characters leveled up uh, the other big thing I started doing more of that helped me level up was when I thought about a character we have so many primary sources you can read about in our world today of people's blogs and things like that talking about their lives. You can do some real re research and get into the heads um, of these wonderful people who have shared their life experiences. And that will teach you reading a lot of what people say. Reading a lot and listening to them will help you level up to make your characters uh, not just be cardboard cutouts, um, who are there to fill a role, but will feel, you know, you have the illusion, because you can't create real people, but have the illusion. You'll, you'll get better at really digging into how people think, act, and, uh, and learn, and the differences between them and yourselves. One of your, your biggest challenges as a writer will be not making every character feel like a different incarnation of you. And you do this, in my experience, by listening really well, by paying attention, by learning. And... From there, uh, making characters want things, have goals, work toward those goals, um, and not always goals that are directly parallel to the plot. These are all things that are going to help a ton. Um, 
there are so many pieces of advice I could give you, however, um, and there are so many right ways to do this. There's many right ways to do this, as I often say, as there are people who are writing stories. And so you don't have to take just my advice on it, listen to a lot of different writers, and also just experiment and find out what creates characters that connect with your audience the way that you want them to. Um, this next question question is for Isaac. Um, people are wondering who's going to be producing the playing cards. Excellent question. So that's that's a really good question. Um, but it, it is the the U.S. PCC or whatever. Yeah, that yeah. It's it, they're the they're the ones that make all the playing cards for the <laughs> Vegas casinos and things like that. We did we did some research. We talked to some people. Some people made suggestions to Brandon. Yeah, uh, but thank we. You. Yeah. For those who sent me suggestions. Um, and and we, we are using, we're using them. We're going to print the, the cards on that, that kind of um, pseudo linen feel. So it has a bit of a texture to it. It's not just going to be straight up uh, smooth um, UV Yeah, we went printing. to a bunch of people who really like cards and asked them, where should we print these and things mm -hmm. like that. And uh, depending on, depending on uh, I mean, we have the economics of scale. On our mm -hmm. side right now, we're printing a lot of these, and that gives us a little more opportunity to make these nicer. Mm -hmm. um, so we are we, we planned a certain amount to spend on, on a lot of these different goals, and if because of the economics of scale lets me add something cool to the playing cards, I will try to do that to make them uh, nicer. I don't know what yeah. all of those options are yet, but we're gonna make them cool. And Rebecca um, Jensen, who is doing the artwork, is doing a fantastic job, and uh, she's 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 an amazing artist. You guys are gonna love it. Um, they're also wondering if just the face cards will have art, or if all the cards will have art. Um, it'll just be the uh, the face cards. Um, I'm producing 52 pieces of art, or, or you know 54, whatever it is with the jokers and things, is a, a huge job. It's already a huge job job to do four or five per uh, suit suit of cards. So and they will be different depending on the suits. Um, the art. Yeah. Yeah. So we we've themed these all, and that's that would be a good thing for an update is to tell you who is going to be in each one. But for example, Kaladin and uh, Syl are in the same suit. I think they're. Uh, I think he's the King of Hearts, for example. Um, and uh, so we, we've themed them all toward different things like that. If you guys like it, we might try others in the future. We'll see yeah. how it goes. Yeah, that's one of those things that you never feel like you can get too many of as decks of playing yeah. cards. It's yeah. always having one at hand is handy, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, so so an another thing that we are that we're thinking about as we design the uh, Rebecca's doing the bulk of the work of the designing, but um, working on art director is these is I I want them to be u usable playable I see a lot of card decks that are novelty decks that they're they're kind of busy or something they have cool artwork and things mm -hmm. but they're not as playable as cards and I'm keeping that in mind with these I'm hoping that they'll be able to be usable um, for games and things and and I, I think they will be uh, so Brandon question for you yep. Uh, unrelated to the Kickstarter, mm. uh, they want to know if you'll ever consider writing a Tensoon or Chondra book or series. Uh, I could see doing a novella. Um, um, will there be a full series? There are way too many full series things that need to happen already in the Cosmere. That's surprising. Um, so, yeah. Uh, chances that you get Chondra viewpoints in upcoming books is much higher than... Um, or that you get a novella, you know, is much higher than an actual book series. Um, that said, you know, um, there's also the experiment we might do, well, we're planning to do, we're having um, Isaac write some Cosmere stuff. Uh, it's going to start his graphic novels and things like that. But, yeah. um, you know, Isaac has been in this from the very beginning, and he's one of the few people I would trust to do Cosmere stuff, and so oh, maybe you. Isaac will be like, I want to write this. I, and you asked the question, and I wrote a note down yeah. here, because mm -hmm. we were playing with Mistborn stuff, and yep. that it, knowing what people are interested in seeing might spur something cool. Yeah, I got a really cool Conjure character that I'm waiting to slot into a book eventually. <laughs> um, that's going to be a lot of fun when I can find a spot for him. 
Um, Yuri says, do you sometimes fear that the audience won't like the book? Specifically, are you feeling that with Rhythm of War right now as it's on its final stages? Nope, uh, not with Rhythm of War. Um, <laughs> because I generally, because particularly Stormlight books, I have a very exhaustive um, beta reading process. I know what people are going to, in general, how they're going to respond to the book. Um, and... Um, things I, I worry about um, are generally things that are more experimental, like um, the third Stephen Lead story, right? Which was pretty, um, in many ways, thematically different from a lot of uh, other stuff I'd written. That one I wondered about. Worry is the wrong term, though. Um, my worry isn't that people re respond poorly to my work. It is that I will not be able to properly express what I want, if that makes sense. Like, I am totally fine with people reading like the third Stephen Leeds novella and being like, this did not click for me. Um, or, you know, some people will be like, this was the most incredible thing you've written. Like, sometimes you will write something that is very different and you are very pleased with it, even though you know the audience might not be as big. Um, that doesn't worry me. Uh, that's the piece of art I wanted to create. Um, I had this with the short story Dreamer, right? One of my non-Cosmere uh, related things I wrote for a horror anthology. Um, Peter Alstrom, my, you know, editorial director, does not like that story. It's his, the only Brandon Sanderson story he do, actively does not like. And that's fine, right? Like, the reasons he doesn't like it are not related to Brandon did not convey what he wanted to convey. They are related to Brandon conveyed something that is not enjoyable for me in a story. Um, what I worry about is I will try something and it will be misinterpreted or I won't have the skill to achieve what I want to achieve. Uh, that, hopefully, we are able to iron out through beta reads and uh, for me not to be surprised. Uh, right now... The fifth draft, I, you guys know I get very tired of books by the time that I'm getting to the end of it. Um, and so, yeah, I'm pretty tired of Rhythm of War. But I am also pretty confident you guys are going to really enjoy the book. Um, and fortunately, the 5.0 draft is not the I hate it, uh, I need to escape from it. Um, it's the 4.0 draft that is that, that I just finished. In fact, uh, both on the 4.0 of this, and it was one, a different one earlier... I, I wrote a short story one night in the middle of working on this one. Uh, things are really dire if Brandon writes a sh actual short story. Just let me tell you that. Um, it's it's 3,500 3, words. It's like a, a legit short story. Um, and that's when those sorts of things pop up, uh, like in the Dropbox, that's when the team knows, oh, Brandon is getting really tired of doing whatever he's doing right now because he's... He's stooping so far as to write short fiction. Um, and so, yeah. Th those, for us, though, sometimes are the the funnest emails to get because, mm -hmm. yeah, there's that, oh, Brandon must be bored or working hard or whatever mm -hmm. it is, right? It's not, a great not, surprise for us. But it's a great mm -hmm. surprise for us because it's like, hey, something new to read. I mean, for us, that's like release day. So, um, yeah. I just workshopped that short story. It has some problems. Fortunately, I have Eric James Stone in my writing group, who is a master of the short story form, and he often has really good feedback to give on short fiction. My only my like, I would say my second true short story, even Dreamer, I think was like seven thousand words, and so inching into novelette, um, I can't remember a hundred percent, but um, I don't write a lot of under seven thousand words. I I'm. I'm pretty good at novellas, right? Like, I like novellas. I actively read novellas. I enjoy them. Um, but when you're getting under 7,000 words, that's a, that's a realm I'm not as comfortable in. And, uh, yeah, it's good for me to practice it. But when it happens, it happens because I'm bored of everything else. Let's do another fan mail. Yeah. And Peter just chimed in on the chat. He's like, he's right. I do not like three words. So <laughs> yep. Glad we yep. There you go. Peter's, uh, P Peter's verified it. Um, ooh. Oh, look at this. Look at that. Oh, hey. hey. Yay. I'll, I'll let you hold this up. Uh, oh, it for the... right there, so oh, was it? Okay. We'll just hold it up again then. We have some uh, some Nbot and Doomslug 
uh, fan art here, which is very well done. I love it. Uh, recently read your book Skyward. I don't tell you much how much I enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Tessa. Uh, this art is awesome. I wonder if you got the inspiration from Doom Slug's character from your parrot Magellan. So I wrote Doom Slug before I had Magellan. However, I have had pet birds since I was a kid. Um, I love parrots. I'm, other people are dog people or cat people. I'm a parrot person. And so I've basically always had a parrot. There was a period in my life where the kids were young that um, my other, my, my cockatiel beaker went to live with my mom because the kids were tormenting him. But now they're old enough and um, they're afraid enough of Magellan that <laughs> uh, we, we can have a parrot again. So parrot behavior influences a lot of how I treat animal behavior uh, because of that. So yes, any suggestions of other sci-fi books that you might enjoy? Um, Let's see. Um, so, if you haven't, um, if you want, they, they uh, specifically say they want something to scratch that the e uh, edge of sci-fi, itch of sci-fi, without overwhelming like Dune did. Uh, if you want something a little less overwhelming, um, I can recommend Dan Wells's Mirador books, which are really great. Um, they're cyberpunk. Um, uh, YA uh, science fiction, uh, and they are brilliant. They are some of Dan's best work, and Dan is a really great writer. So I would recommend that to you. Um, what other what other things? Science fiction. Um, it's kind of uh, fast paced and fun uh, science fiction stories. Yeah, you guys, the newer stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Ender's game, Ender's is, game is very Ender's similar game is great. to uh, Ender's Game. Is fantastic. Uh, if yeah. If you haven't read Ender's Game, Ender's Game, um, Ender's Game is like a gimme though, right? Yeah, like, it's yeah, like, yeah. Um, well, that's how good it is. It's like, if you, it's like not having read Hamlet, uh, not having read Ender's Game. Uh, it's odd to find someone. So um, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm going to, to pitch maybe, and these are old again. Yeah. But that, but it's maybe something that a, a, a new generation might enjoy, or the Michael Crichton books. Oh. Um, that because I remember going from Ender's Game to Jurassic Park as a teenager. Michael Crichton's a great writer, and he's really great. So. Mm -hmm. um, yep, uh, there is some language to watch out for in some of his. In books. some of his, yeah. Um, so if that is uh, sensitive to you, uh, but the Great Train Robbery is probably my favorite Crichton after Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park is it's the best. Just really good. Um, but Sphere was good. Sphere and, is amazing. Yeah. Um, Congo. Congo. Don't, is, don't judge it on the movie because yep. that book is pretty mm -hmm. good. Yeah. So. But that's that's, that's, that's a, a similar suggestion. sort of itch yeah. because it has the science, but he explains the science in, yeah. in easy to understand mm -hmm. ways. So, so, are you coming? Is she coming over here by you, me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're my wife. You can be. I don't have. To social you don't distance. have to social distance. You can pull. Yeah, we can. Actually, since I'm going like this, if you want to pull this right there. Right there. Yes. Replacing. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt the conversation. Oh, it's fine. If you, if, if you want me to be done, I'm happy to do that no, no, too. No, you're, you're, you're fine. I can, I can sit here and just shoot the breeze with everybody as well. So, um, Emily, what day is it today that you are giving me up for this? Today is our 14th wedding anniversary. So. Woo! We're going to celebrate tomorrow instead. So. We were always planning to celebrate tomorrow because yes. we do our date nights on Wednesday. But uh, you get me on my anniversary, so. Uh. I thought it was appropriate because it's 10th anniversary of the yeah, Kings. Yeah, that's true. It's our anniversary. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Isn't this the same day that a Mistborn came out as well? Is it the exact? Is it? I'd, I'll have to look it up. I'm going to look well, it up. The Something with Mistborn, because we had Mistborn at our wedding reception. Right? We did our have it at, at our wedding dinner. We had like copies author something? copies. Yeah, we had early yeah. copies. Maybe everyone that's what signed it was. one. Yeah, everyone signed one. I'm at my wedding it. dinner. Yes. And everybody got swords. Not everybody, yeah. but a lot of people got swords. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you guys, uh, Emily decided uh, to stop by because we are celebrating. You missed the, uh, <laughs> the, the confetti. Best. Um, but little ah, here, give, mm -hmm. give, give them, give them little poppers. Oh, we can mm -hmm. celebrate the, uh, the anniversary, uh, our anniversary. Your, whoops. Sorry. Little, here, I'll give you another one. Little champagne popper things. Yeah. Okay. Ready? Mm-hmm. <laughs> went right on my shirt. Awesome. I won't, uh, <clears throat> touch that right now. <laughs> I was thinking that I should tell the story of the swords. Okay. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Have you told it before? Uh, not on stream, I don't think. I mean, I've told it before, but I don't think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So Mistborn was 10 days later, July okay. 17th. Mm. So. so, yeah, we probably had author copies then. Mm -hmm. Yep. So what's, what's the story of the swords? So, um, <laughs> we were engaged and we were planning our wedding. And Brandon tells me he wants to get swords for his groomsmen. And grooms-woman. And grooms-woman. He had one grooms-woman. Yes. His friend Annie. Um, Annie, the inspiration for Serene in uh, the Elantris. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, and, and how many did you end up getting? Like 12 or 13. Yeah, that was a lot. Um, you know, it's kind of, oftentimes it's tradition for the groom to give small gifts to the groomsmen or the bride to give yep. small gifts to the bridesmaids. I think that my bridesmaids would rather have been groomsmen because <laughs> they got necklaces and uh, your groomsmen and groomswoman got swords. But anyway, as we were planning this and Brandon would come over and show me, and, and at first I thought, oh, toy swords, yeah, whatever. No, these were not toy swords. They were more like replicas. Yeah, they were, uh, they were, um, what's the term? They were battle-ready battle ready replicas. Battle-ready, right. but they yeah. weren't sharpened. They weren't yeah. sharpened, they weren't etched. They were yeah, sharpened, they were not but not edged. edged. But yeah, they were based on historical swords to be used in reenactment. Yes. So real, real swords. And as he would, you know, show me what he was, where he was getting them and choosing them and who he was going to give them to and what he was going to etch on them, I was like, I want a sword. But he said, no, you have a ring. And I was like, well, good point. So I didn't complain. But then one night he showed up with a sword and said, look, my sword came. Um, what do you think? And I looked at it and I was like, it's kind of small and rather feminine looking, you know? <laughs> and he said, no, just kidding, it's yours. And so I had a sword and I was so excited. Um, what did we do? We took we took Brandon's sword and sliced a watermelon with it. Mm -hmm. Later on, after he had left, my roommate at the time and I took my sword and tried to find as many things as we could cut with it as possible. We threw mushrooms up in the air and sliced them. And we uh, <laughs> stabbed a, a water bottle full of water and had a lot of fun with them. I got a hand in a halfer, um, one of the kings of England um, replica, and you got a basket hilted rapier. Yes. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so. Oh, might not have been a rapier, it might have been. Oh, you've got them. Oh, yeah. We took yeah. them off the wall. <laughs> I, uh, I asked him to yeah, bring the pictures. Yeah, that's not a right here. That's, uh, <laughs> it's got more of a blade on it. You guys will have to tell me. The sword experts. Maybe Shad is watching and tell us what it is. Yeah. So um, here's Brent. I don't want him on the table. It's not even a basket hilt. I was totally wrong. That's but how good my memory is. That that's kind of girly, you know? Mm hmm As... Mm hmm So anyway. Yep. They're hanging our, upstairs now. Our wedding swords. Our wedding swords. And... Uh, the groomsmen, Brandon told them all to bring their swords to the wedding reception. Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, my song, <coughs> Stabby. My, yeah. my sword is Light Song. Yep. I, think you, you I named them all, all after books or characters in books. Um, so how do you think you're going to pop a balloon? Oh, yeah, you could pop, uh, pop a balloon. <laughs> what is that that I got you? It's not a cavalry sword. Um, I have no idea what that is. It is pretty. I have to go back and look. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Vanquished. Um, but then we cut our wedding cake with Brandon's sword. Mm-hmm. And all the groomsmen brought their swords, and groomswoman, mm -hmm. brought their swords to the wedding, and we had way too much fun. Yeah, um, we are super nerds. <laughs> we, are. we don't do, like, SC or stuff. <laughs> Basically, just because we accidentally never got involved in that, I guess. But we, we had swords. Liked it if we yeah. Had that mm -hmm. but, but. Yeah, so this is Brandon's, and it's. So, side sword is what people are calling side it. Side sword? Yeah. There's something, like, there's a specific style, I've got, I, I feel like. I mean, it is, it is a bit of a side sword. It is, I mean. It's an arming sword, right? But mm -hmm. it's kind of long for a side sword, isn't it? I don't know. <laughs> But anyway, that is the story of our swords, mm -hmm. and we've they, had them oh, ever since. Yeah, the name of Brandon's sword. Um, yeah, I think mine has dragon steel on it, doesn't yeah. it? His is dragon steel. Yeah. Yep. Seven seven zero six dragon steel. Mm -hmm. And for those wondering if unsheathing it released black smoke, there's your answer. Nah. Yeah. No black smoke. <laughs> no black smoke. But luckily, mm -hmm. they're uh, fairly benign swords. Um, 
yeah, so that's the story of our wedding swords. You can take these you back now. Back? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, they are a little... Mm -hmm. We now, every time I dedicate a book to someone, we get them a sword. Uh, and Shad says, yes, it's a side sword. It a is side a side sword. sword? Okay, there we go. Shad's our expert, so. Um, Thanks, Shad. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to, I have to go make sure children are not destroying things. In you just while, wanted to say hi. I want to say hi. And Does anyone have hard, a question? Hard questions for mm -hmm. me. We're signing your book. Ah, Warbreaker. That's right. It is kind of my book. Mm -hmm. So Warbreaker is my book because Brandon was writing it when we were, when I think you'd started it before we met. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I was writing it on our honeymoon. Yeah. When so we, when we first met and were dating and engaged and first married, he was writing Warbreaker. And yes. since he was doing the experiment of putting it on his website, um, he would send me. He didn't really edit, but he would kind of send it to me first, and I would change some of the most horrible typos, and then, or at least suggest changes, and then mm -hmm. put it up. And so I got to yep. read it before anyone else, which hasn't ever really happened again. Like, usually I read probably third draft with writing group or whatever, third, fourth. But um, it was really interesting to see the things that he'd written, and then know how they fit into his experiences because I was living those experiences with him. Yep, you do that with a lot of books. You're like, hey, that conversation we had about such and such, mm -hmm. that ended up right there. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I don't think anyone else would ever be able to tell, mm -hmm. but it was it was pretty fun to do that. I was I was a teacher at the time, and so he would email the, the chapters to me, and I would sit at my desk and look very busy doing mm -hmm. things on my computer after school when I was actually reading Warbreaker, so... Which eventually became your job. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Best job ever. You so, don't say that during tax time. That's true. During tax time is not the best job ever. So we have a few questions. Uh, the first is, what kind of chocolate do you like? <laughs> All of it. I do like dark chocolate. Probably that was their guess. Know. Yep. She likes dark chocolate more than I do. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to give chocolate and make sure that I'm not going to sample it, before That's it gets right. to her, uh, fancy dark chocolate. You don't like it like super dark. You like no. just the uh, the just the darker. The dark. Yeah. Um, they want to know who your favorite Stormlight character is. My favorite Stormlight character. It kind of varies. I really like Wit. And oh, Wit. They want to know how you deal with Brandon's late hours. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a funny story to this one too because um, I knew he was a night owl he's always been a night owl and but I thought you know when we get married then you're supposed to go to bed at the same time as your spouse that's just what you do and he's like okay I'll try that and then he would go to bed when I went to bed and then he would just lay there for hours and hours <laughs> and finally I was like this is ridiculous I knew it wouldn't last but I, I was willing <laughs> was to give it the to college try, try. She was a school teacher back then, and so she got up at six. Yep. Um, I go to bed at six nowadays. <laughs> um, lately. Lately, I've been going to bed yeah. at six. But since um, it actually turned out working out pretty well, because I think a lot of times if you both work from home, um, on the times when Brandon's not traveling, it'd be easy to kind of get in each other's way or get frustrated with each other. But we kind of each have our alone times Although lately my alone times are full of children, because so, they don't have school. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, Brandon has fa we do family time and we have us time, and then I kind of have my time in the morning, and he has his time late at night, and it works out really well for us actually. I think it could be a problem if you didn't know how to balance and make it all fit. But she but would I stay up late too. I would if I could get away with if it. If you could get away with it. I've become more and more nocturnal mm. after having been married to you and not having to teach. So, uh, What is your favorite book? My favorite book? That's a hard one. I know what your favorite book is. It's The Blue Sword. Mm. My favorite book from my teenage years is The Blue Sword by Robin McKinney. And that's one that I would read like at least once a year. Um, when I was in junior high and high school, and 
I like a lot of her other stuff too, but that's if I'm gonna choose a book, that's probably my favorite. What's your favorite classic? Favorite classic? Probably Pride and Prejudice. Mm, it's a good one. It's a great one. Our second date, we went to the Kiara Knightley Pride and Prejudice. That's right. that's uh, it was it was since we're in Utah, uh, which for some reason is a uh, is a Jane Austen hotbed. Um, <laughs> We uh, ended up on the second row because the showing was sold out. So we joke we spent the whole time looking at Mr. Darcy's nose. Yeah. Second date. I'm going to open this piece of fan mail here. Maybe Emily here because they told me this one is kind of special. So, uh, so this is from Amy. Amy, thank you for this thing. Two branded. Okay. Ooh. This looks pretty... Pretty extreme. Do you want to open that and I'll read this thing? Okay. Uh, you mentioned a love for Legend of Zelda. Included you will find. Ooh. Oh, wow. <gasps> Look at that. Someone knows how to make pretty leather bounds. The unofficial Legend of Zelda cookbook by Amy <laughs> Wood. Ah, <laughs> thank you, Amy. That is awesome. You that know how to put together so a really nice book. Cool. We know this firsthand, <laughs> yeah. how difficult it is to make these. And that looks gorgeous. I was wondering if you could talk more about contemporary indie publishing versus traditional versus hybrid in the fantasy genre. If you could debut again, which would you choose today? What a wonderful question, Amy. Thank you. Um, oh, give Magellan a pat for me. He is, uh, he's in bed right now. I'll give him a pat for you tomorrow. Um, so, Some of these sound really fun. Uh, <laughs> so... Indie versus traditional right now in fantasy specifically. Fantasy is a, a tough one um, because um, indie publishing, anything can work indie publishing is what we're finding. Um, but uh, indie publishing still tends to do best in shorter, quicker reads that can be large number of volumes in the same series. And so it lends itself very well, for instance, to um, Bob Salvatore style uh, adventure fantasy um, and epic fantasy, which takes generally because they're longer, longer to write uh, with longer releases between them, is a little bit tougher. Um, but it doesn't mean it can't be done. There are some people doing it uh, quite well. Um, but my instincts are Number one, that you should talk to indie published people like Shad, who is in the chat right now, uh, who is an indie published fantasy novelist, um, among other things, and ask them. I need another one of these pens. Oh, they're right there. Thanks. Um, um, my instincts say that hybrid for fantasy is still your best bet unless you already um, are able to get an audience in some other way. If you are drawing an audience on your own already, there is no reason to go traditional. Um, I would expect that uh, indie would be the way to go. But if you don't already have an audience, then a publisher can still do quite a bit for you by lending you the authority and some of their audience. But I maintain the best, what I would probably do is I would write books, I would try to sell them, to top tier uh, traditional presses for good advances. And if I am not getting offers like that, then I would start indie publishing them. And I would see if my indie publishing career takes off. And I would continue to do that. Basically, I would work a couple years behind. I would write the books, I would edit the books, I would take a couple years to submit them. Um, and as a book went through the rounds of submission and didn't sell, I would indie publish them. And if they began to gain, gain traction indie published, I would refocus my efforts there. If they happened to land a major publishing deal with a large publisher, I would invest in that and see how that goes. Um, I think that hybrid is the smartest way for most authors to be right now. Um, though if you have a solid audience of your own, then um, indie publishing is the way to go. Uh, but if you are writing very slowly and it, or if um, you really do not want to deal with the headaches that come with uh, indie publishing, like coming up with your own cover and things like that, then traditionally published, uh, traditional publishing can skew you that direction instead. We have some writer friends who've done 
several mm -hmm. different versions of hybrids of these things. So it is interesting to see what takes off for which writers. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Jancy, uh, who uh, I co-authored the last Alcatraz book with, is a great person to talk to as well. Uh, she's been doing indie publishing. She had did traditional publishing, is now doing indie publishing, and she knows a lot about both of them. I am, in some ways, I'm a good person to ask this to because I teach a lot of students, so I try to pay attention and pass along the information I get. I Basically, I file away facts that might be useful to my students more often than I wouldn't than I would if I didn't have that. But in the other hand, I'm a bad person to ask because I'm a person who can launch a Kickstarter and uh, that is somewhere around five times as large as the largest publishing Kickstarter um, ever because I already have an established fan base and audience. And so, Indie publishing for me is a very different experience. Yes, the Dragonsteel Entertainment Leatherbounds are indie published, but uh, not indie published in the same way. In, in yeah, sense. because I already have a very strong audience for my traditional publishing. So um, they're wondering what it was like to dis oh. they're wondering what it was like for uh, Emily to discover Brandon's universe. What it was like to go through the Cosmere. Mm. Awesome. Tell them about getting a Elantris from that guy over there. <laughs> so we got set up on a blind date in November, I think, of 2005. Elantris came out in May of 2005. Mm -hmm. And a mutual friend, who happens to be Isaac Stewart here, set us up on a blind date. And um, Brandon talked about that he was a writer. And I was like, well, I, I love fantasy and, and always have. And so, yeah, sure, I'd love to read your book. And Isaac gave me a copy of Elantris, and I uh, started... That I had it. given to Isaac and told him to give to you so it wouldn't look like I was trying to give. I yeah. <laughs> remember that. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I still have that exact copy, too. Mm. But I remember reading that book and, and starting out feeling rather skeptical. You know, somebody, this guy says he's an author and talks about, uh-huh, yeah, sure, you're an author. But as I got further and further into the book, I was like, oh, yeah, he is an author. And I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I have to admit, I am not a last pager normally. That's mm -hmm. someone who like flips to the end just to find out how the book ends. But there were some little hints of, of romance in Elantris in the beginning, and I was like, hmm, where is this going? And I flipped to the end to make sure that the, uh, they ended up together. So. <laughs> Emily was one of the first people to get the whole pitch on the Cosmere. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember you like sitting down and noting out. Yeah, right. That was so. The first time I, I pitched it to you is when I was working on the Mistborn trilogy before I had written it, um, before I'd uh, released it, yeah. and um, I was doing the revisions on the first one, mm -hmm. um, and I was talking about the nine book series. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, whoa. Um, and then the thing that you're remembering was at a family reunion of yours mm -hmm. um, where I did not have my laptop, so I had a notebook and instead was writing in the notebook and mm -hmm. things and was uh, sketching out uh, what was the 36 books there, what, where they would all fall. It's changed a lot since then, but mm -hmm. I feel like you said you still have that somewhere, but I we haven't been able to find it. do still have um, But somewhere. kind of the original outline of the uh, of the Cosmere. Um, I remember watching you, you know, kind of jot that all out and mm -hmm. thinking, okay, this is this is really happening. I, mm -hmm. I keep hold of this piece of paper, so. Yep. But every every book in the Cosmere has just been more and more fun. Um, I've always loved epic fantasy and the big books that have a lot going on and a lot of different characters and so it's been it's been really fun to be involved a little on the sidelines of the cosmere so um all right last question last maybe? question yeah. it's kind of a two-parter okay um i think you answered this question but it was in the dark one exclusive chat talking okay. about what order you belong to and then they're wondering okay. what order emily belongs to so I got, and I can't remember which one was on top and which one was second, but I was, they were very close. Um, I got Elskaller and uh, Bondsmith, um, which are the places I would have sorted myself. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's when I knew the test was doing a good job. Mm -hmm. And my talk was Bondsmith. I don't remember what the second one was. I think mm -hmm. they were, it was pretty close, but. Yep. 
which I thought was pretty cool. Mm. One last question. Okay. Um, just uh, maybe talking about your process about picking chapter titles for oh, the yeah. Stormlight books. Yeah. Emily's doing the chapter titles yeah, right now. That's, it's been really fun. I wouldn't say I really pick them because the betas come up with a fantastic list of possibilities. And Peter has a lot to say about what really fits. But with... Um, I think I... Did I start in Words of Radiance? I think you did, yeah. I don't yeah. think I did it during Way of Kings. But really, in Words of Radiance, I think it was just Brandon and Peter were both just too busy. And so I got on the, the beta document and looked at everyone's suggestions and kind of skimmed back... Because I'd read the book before, but skimmed back through the, the chapters and kind of chose a, a, a chapter title that would fit. And it's been really fun to be involved in that way. Um, both to see the kind of the test audience reactions and to you know because i always i get impatient and as soon as brandon will let me i read the whole book so <laughs> when i choose chapter <laughs> titles i reread it again more slowly and you always get different things out of it when you read it slowly so that's been really fun well uh again thank you guys uh thanks for the uh the the kickstarter enthusiasm thanks for sharing it around um we're gonna do these live streams once a week uh from now on they'll be on thursdays except for the last one which will be uh oh it'll still no, be on so thursday be because thursday, yeah because yeah, we end on a friday before i get up i think just not this week uh yeah because that was tonight yeah tonight's was this week but next week we'll be back on uh thursday and we will be posting on the kickstarter and uh on the blog updates uh and pieces of art but either way, uh, thank you guys so much. You have made this a uh, very wonderful experience for the one day it's been going on. Uh, and hopefully the other 29 are equally fun. <laughs>